Hey everybody, today Rado runs through his 2018 shelf update. And folks, 2018 is a bloodbath. Look at it! Oh my gosh! Now you, if you're a regular person, might be thinking, wait a minute, that looks like a ridiculously obscene amount of board games. Who needs that many games? That's a reasonable observation to make. But longtime viewers of this collection update series I've been doing knows this is a ridiculously um, a short, a small amount of games. Where are all the ones that used to be stacked all the way up to the ceiling? And what's this? Can you actually see wall in certain places? Yes, folks. Here's the deal. In 2018, Jen and I in a few months will be moving back to the States. And it is very expensive to move. Uh, across the Atlantic, especially when you've got hundreds and hundreds of board games to pack up that are mostly air, really kind of not very efficient. So over the last few weeks, I have literally been ripping my guts out, getting rid of a lot of games, dozens and dozens and dozens of games that I'm well past getting rid of games. You're like, eh, you know, whatever, I could take it or leave it. I'm getting rid of games that I absolutely love. And things have kind of stabilized today. I don't have the exact number on me, but it's like 150 games have been removed from my collection. Maybe a few more are going to go out before we make the move, but I'm thinking this is going to be where we stabilize. Now, at the same time, around 40 games have been added over 2017. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. What are the new games that now live on my shelf? And if you want to know what's been removed or a full list of what's been added, there's a list down in the show notes. And there's also a link if you want to go to gone.rado.com where you can see a list of every game I've ever gotten rid of and why. Now, if you go look at it now, you'll find a lot of entries are because I'm moving. <laughs> um, a, a lot, you know, a lot, lot, lot. I, it's just been, oh man, I, I love these things, but they're just things, folks. They're just things. They don't matter. It's good to unburden myself, but let's not talk about what I've gotten rid of. Let's talk about what I've added. As always, starting over here in the corner, my number one game of the year, the number one game on board game, the greatest board game of all time, Gloomhaven. I have already talked about this so much, I don't know that I have anything else to add at this point other than I love it, love it, love it. I have spent more hours playing this game than any other board game, than most other board games combined. I still look forward to many, many more hours of it. I've got an insert for it now that I'll be filming pretty soon so you can see how that works. Oh my goodness, folks. Gloomhaven is the bee's knees. It lives up to the hype. Love it to bits. Uh, but let's move over to something else. Hey, Anachrony over there in the corner. Uh, now, I haven't actually played the new version, but we really enjoyed the prototype when we had it on Kickstarter, so I'm looking forward to seeing all the cool stuff, including all those amazing minis. Absolutely great worker placement game with time travel uh, shenanigans mixed in. Lovely stuff, Anachrony. Now, this is, uh, this, I have an on-again, off-again relationship with Runebound for years now. Jen, I really like the second edition. I got rid of it all um, to get the third edition, and then we found out we don't like the third edition. But then an expansion came out that turned it into a co-op, and we like that quite a bit. So, Jen's at the door. Hold on, everybody. Okie doke, she just got back from walking the dogs. Where was I? Oh, Runebound, right. Uh, on again, off again, but now that it's a fully co-op, it's a keeper. Really enjoy this third edition with the cooperative rules quite a bit. Done a run through so you can see why. Then let's talk about Legends of Andor, The Last Hope, the third in the trilogy. And folks, we've loved Andor so much, played it so many times. And uh, uh, Journey to North was good. It was, it's, it's a great Andor game, but it wasn't quite as good. Also, we're just starting out with Last Hope. I'm a little bit worried. I kind of lean it more to Journey to the North, whereas this is still just about perfection. It may be that once we finish both of those, I might get rid of them because this will keep me coming back forever. But I got to finish out the story. I got to see how it ends with the Last Hope. Then, hey, Clank, we already did that, right? I've had that for a while. Actually, in this box is Clank in Space. Uh, it's absolutely awesome that the core game and its expansion, Sunken Treasures, and Clank in Space all fix and fit in one box. So I just pulled that out to mention Clank in Space is definitely a keeper, as is Spirit Island, an absolutely awesome cooperative game unlike anything else out there where players are the spirit of an island trying to uh, terrorize the settlers of Catan, effectively, not that they're named that, um, and scare them off the island. Really cool, really clever. Need to play it some more. It might push its way into my top 10 of the year, because I have to do an update for that, although I don't want to have time to do that with all the moving that's going on. Uh, standing up! We get to the Seventh Continent, and a phenomenal game. Just missed my top 10 of the year for various reasons I talked about when I did my update to it, but an incredible adventure experience. Don't know if I've ever said any of my run-throughs, but really, other people have pointed out, and I agree, this is basically missed the board game 
um, you know, kind of crossed with Indiana Jones. Really one of a kind, phenomenal experience. I backed the Kickstarter for the expansions. Can't wait for them to show up. Although they're just shipping now. Will they actually make it here before we leave? That's a problem I got to worry about too. But anyway, Seventh Continent is the bee's knees, as is Flatline, or I wouldn't have held on to it. This is basically the sequel to Kane Klenko's. Uh, fuse. In here, we were disarming bombs on a spaceship. Now, some of those bombs went off, and we're in the medical bay on that spaceship trying to heal people before they die. Another great real time uh, play. Everybody cooperatively manipulate and draft for dice, but in a different way from Fuse. It's a bigger, more complex game, which means Fuse still gets more play, but we really enjoy Flatline too. Then I've got Natillion, which I haven't actually even played yet, but I've got my full collection of. Uh, Oniverse games, Attilian and Sylveon and Castellion. Uh, looking forward to giving it a try because it looks really, really cool. A roll and move game uh, that can be played cooperatively. Neat stuff. Then, Pandemic Rising Tide. Really, of course, love Pandemic. Loved Pandemic Iberia. That was a keeper, as is Rising Tide. I'll have a run through for that coming pretty soon. The, uh, what was it, the Call of Cthulhu. That one wasn't a keeper, it was too simple, but Rising Tide is very neat. It's not perfect. But it's really neat, a uh, great bunch of wrinkles to the formula, so we've enjoyed it, and it's a keeper, right? Pandemic Rising Tide. <laughs> I am not sure what's wrong with my eyes, since this is just jumping right out at me, but I forgot when I just filmed this to mention Codenames Duet. And actually, I've had Codenames for a while, and uh, whatever it was last year or the year before, we picked up Codenames Pictures, and we have now picked up Codenames Duet as well. Got the whole set, everything works great. We're amazing how well they all work, two players. And what's even better is, Everything released so far in the Made Codenames line fits in one box. Hooray! So we've got them all in here, and now let's continue. Coming along, we've got Sentient. Wow. This is a very, this is a gorgeous game. I think most people would consider it an abstract, one of those new wave of gorgeous looking abstract style games. And, you know, I, I'm fine with that. I, I tend to see theme where others don't. And to me, it's a nice thematic game of a far future utopian society programming robots by um, drafting for uh, dice and cards. Well, actually, no, drafting for cards and then manipulating dice that represents reprogramming our mainframes to be able to plug our robots in and do AI stuff. It's neat. It's gorgeous. It's incredibly clever and puzzly. We like it a lot. Sentient. Then, Baron Park. A lot of polyomino games have come out recently. Most of them from designer Uwe Rosenberg, but this one from Phil Walker Harding. And of all of them, this is the keeper. It outlasted the patchworks and the Oh, the Cottage Gardens and you know, all the other ones because it is an absolutely lovely Tetris tile laying uh, slash drafting game that we really enjoy a lot. Even if we find the subject matter a little bit problematic, I talked about that in the run through, but even still, great, great stuff, totally a keeper. Then we got Century Spice Road. Now this is an odd one. I wouldn't have kept it. We liked the gameplay, but we didn't love it. We didn't think it scaled all that well for two. Definitely needed more players to be at its best. But here's why I kept it. Because this year, 2018, the sequel is going to come out. A standalone game. Or here it's called Century Something Else. And it's a totally different style of game. But that game and this game can merge into an Uber game. And I'm really, I'm holding us because I want to see how that works out. And hopefully, um, you know, the, the new thing will kind of patch in the holes that we found missing in Century Spice Road as a two-player game. Like, it's a good game, don't get me wrong, just not great for two. Then we've got Agra. Oh my gosh, this is a beast of a game. It is a table devourer. It is so huge, but as big as the board is, the ideas and concepts in this sandbox Euro economic game are, you know, blow that out of the water. Really enjoy it quite a bit. Has a lot of systems we love. We love worker bumping uh, in, in worker placement style stuff. Love all the ways that players can interact with each other and kind of help each other even though they're competing. A gorgeous game, gorgeous gameplay. Agra. And let's see, then moving on down. Ah, oh, Charterstone. I talked about this in my run through. We finished the campaign. We played it a few more times. This is totally a keeper. This is our special board. It's unlike anybody else's board in the world. And it's not the greatest worker placement game, but it's a good, solid worker placement game now that the campaign is over. And it has a special place in our hearts because it's ours. We built this thing. We designed it. Um, and it's definitely still fun to play in Charterstone. Then, oh, near and far. I think this made my top 10. I think it did. Uh, this is Ryan Lockett's Masterpiece, a gorgeous game of storytelling and adventure and just 
beautiful, heartwarming, um, you, know, you know, gobsmacking art. I mean, this is his masterpiece. This is what he's been building up to. I'm interested to see what he follows it up with. There's an expansion for it coming, which I've also backed on Kickstarter. But what? How do you follow this game up? It's just just about perfect. But, you know, before that, we also had Islebound, which it took me a while to get my hands on, but I finally got a copy of that. It's Ryan Lockett doing a life of high seas privateering, and it's a beautiful, gorgeous, fast-playing game, too. Uh, it's rare that we actually enjoy Pick Up and Deliver, but it, we did enjoy it in Islebound. Then, Stefan Feld is back with Merlin, teaming up with Michael Renick, the, uh, the designer of, oh, was it? Pillars of the Earth, and well, you know, this was, this was a uh, not quite uh, as much of a, uh, you know, I, Jan and I loved it. We think it's great, totally a keeper, but some people were a bit disappointed. I don't know if they've just put Steve, Stefan Feld on a pedestal now, and he just can't live up to the picture they've got him in their mind, because for us, I mean, it's not his greatest game. It's not going to replace Macau or the Year of the Dragon, but, you know, it's up there with Notre Dame. It's up there with Aquasphere. It's up there with Bora Bora. It's a really sharp, fun game. We liked it a lot. Um, and then, oh, Pursuit of Happiness. Now, I had that a while ago, but then I got rid of it because I knew it was getting reprinted, and I finally got the reprint and the expansion. Lovely, telling life stories, work replacement game, sweet stuff, right next to Dragonfire, the high fantasy sequel to Shadowrun Crossfire, my second highest rated game of all time. Dragonfire is not quite as good as Shadow or Shadowrun Crossfire, but it's still very, very good, and my run-through is coming soon. Ah, Pulsar 2849, another top tenor of the year. Finally, we found a travel, you know, a space 3X game, exploring, exploiting, and expanding, no extermination, that we loved from Vladimir Suji. I'm sorry, I pronounced his name wrong. The uh, designer of Shipyard and Last Will, one of my favorite designers, one of the best games of the year. Good, good stuff. I'm surprised so many people think the board doesn't look nice. We thought it looked great. But the gameplay, who cares about the board? The gameplay is phenomenal. And Pulsar, 2849. Now, sliding on over, we have got the... Oh, uh, I've got the German version. Um, Vetnaf Anak Eldorado. I think it's... It, which is the race for Eldorado, but I think in English it's the quest for Eldorado. Don't know quite why, but great game. Reiner Kinizia turns his attentions, turns his talents towards deck building and makes a really fun, unique game that stands out from the crowd and is just a blast to play. We actually did a live playthrough of this with the internet, a three-player game. That was so much fun. Really, really enjoy uh, Quest for Eldorado quite a bit. Santa Maria made my top ten, though. Man, this game of new world colonization through dice drafting and uh, uh, tableau building, I guess, is just beyond amazing. Uh, this has got to be one of the best puzzly Euros we have ever played. It was the top 10 of the year. I think it's in my top 20 now of all time, or maybe my top 30. Of course, things are changing now because I'm getting rid of so many games. I'll have to rethink those. But anyway, it's gobsmackingly good. Just one of the best. Ah, but another really great one is Otis. This one didn't quite make the top 10, but I think it was top 20. Another really brilliant puzzly Euro style game with incredible presentation. I absolutely love all the components of this game and love the setting in this uh, kind of water world post-apocalypse future where we're diving down deep into the ocean to find artifacts that help us build up society uh, with this cool conveyor belt system that uses, uh, that allows you to move your workers around. Really neat stuff. Again, incredibly fun, incredibly puzzly. Then, I haven't done a run-through for this one yet, but uh, A Column of Fire from Michael Renick again. Just talked about him a little bit ago with uh, Merlin over there. So A Column of Fire is the sequel, the latest, the third in the Pillars of the Earth series. And Jen and I, I think we like this the most. I've heard other people say it's the weakest of the series, but for us it's the best because it is the best at scaling for two. The other games in the Pillars of the Earth, and what was the other one, World Without End, they're... Yeah, they're not as good with two players as they are with more. But Column of Fire, he really knocked it out of the park, and we enjoy it quite a bit. I imagine I'll be doing a run-through soon if the voters ever choose it. But in the meantime, let's climb and go to Role Player, which I'm not quite sure why. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, okay, that's right, yes. It was actually in my top ten from the previous year, but I didn't get it till this year. So I got it a year late, but better late than never because it's amazing. It's interesting, um, you know, I, I got it when, the, uh, when I got the prototype to do a run-through for the... 
for the expansion. And the expansion was good, but not really what we were looking for. So for us, it's still the base game that makes this a keeper so amazing. This dice drafting game where you're trying to roll up a fantasy adventure character. Really fun. Watch my run through for more. But now let's move on to Valletta. Hey, we're leaving Malta, but we're not leaving Valletta, the capital. Another great, great, really unique deck builder from uh, Stephen Dora. And Really enjoy it quite a bit. Obviously, I mean, even if it was only okay, we'd keep it because we got to take something of Malta with us. But like I said, this is actually really, really good. Watch my run through to find out why. Then we got a couple of little ones. Mintworks, I finally got my copy. My, I got rid of my prototype and got a real copy of Mintworks. Hooray! Um, the smallest good work replacement game on the market. So much game in such a tiny little box. Very, very keen on that. And right above it, Rival Realms, which is basically a... A combination of Alf Siegert's Musee and um, Fantastica over here, which is something we're holding on to. We have everything about Fantastica. We love that as an adventure deck builder. And Rival Realms takes the ideas of Fantastica and the ideas of Musee fuses it together into a very clever, puzzly card game that plays really fast. This is a wonderfully puzzly filler game, and we enjoy it quite a bit. Maybe the voters will have me do a run through for it. I don't know. Werfel Bonanza is actually going, but I have this as a placeholder for Bonanza the Duel, which we discovered uh, late, or actually early this year, I think, and it just misses making my top 10 of the year, or maybe it did push into the top 10 of the year, I don't remember, but um, an amazing two-player only version of Bonanza. Now, I don't have Bonanza the Duel with me because I've lent it to a friend of mine, but I will be getting it back before I leave Malta, and this I will be um, trading away, but in the meantime, I just uh, put it here so I wouldn't forget that Bonanza the Duel is amazing. Amazing. Um, Space Race, the card game, is very good too. Not amazing, but really, really sharp. And, um, you know, kind of a, a more grounded modern day race for the galaxy. Don't get me wrong, different gameplay mechanisms, some really clever ones. This notion of you putting your cards out into a common pool that allows everybody to get them, but that's the only way you can get the cards so you can build them, creates an amazing amount of tension. Um, and it's just fun to kind of retell our world space race with a wide range of characters. And a really sharp, clever engine building game. Uh, space race, the card game. Then zipping on over. Medici, the card game. Last year I had Medici, the full game, but after I got Medici, the card game, I got rid of the full game because uh, the card game has all the goodness of that, works better for two, and replaces the auction, which is the toughest thing about Medici. It's kind of tough to teach new people because they have no idea how to sit down and value things. It replaces the auction with a push-your-luck mechanism that is just to die for. I mean, Reiner Knizia, he has not lost it. He is still the master. Uh, and this is just one of several games that he's been re-releasing and adding new stuff to. Actually, no, this is a, a revamp of Medici. He did Medici and then he did Medici the card game. And love the tiny little box, love the gorgeous Vincent to trade art, love the gameplay. Great stuff. Medici the card game. And then we've got uh, Tim Fowers, the Fugitive. A wonderful two-player only asymmetrical duel where one player is the Fugitive trying to uh, stay out of sight and the other is the Marshal trying to find him. Really clever. Uh, I should probably do an update of this because the run-through I did had kind of an ugly prototype and the final game looks great. Yeah, I should really do an update soon. But no time! Let's move on to Castles of Burgundy, the dice game. Now, I re you know, I've picked up Castle Burgundy, the card, and the dice game. And of course, I've got Burgundy. And you'll notice the dice game stayed, the card game went. I really like the card game, don't get me wrong. Although I'm not going to go deep into which game, because you know, there were just too many games. I had to get rid of big boxes, I had to get rid of little boxes, and a Burgundy, the card game is great, but you know, it just gives you the full Burgundy experience in half the time. This gives you a dice version of Burgundy in a, a tenth of the time. And so, uh, since we only ever play Burgundy two-player, it's not too long for us, so we kept Burgundy, we kept the dice game. And we've also kept The Captain is Dead, a lovely pandemic-inspired cooperative game set, might as well be set, on the Starship Enterprise. Of course, it's not for licensing reasons, but it might as well be. I mean, if you've ever wanted to have a co-op pandemic-style experience playing as Kirk and Spock and Bones and Scotty and Uhura and Chekhov and Sulu, or different characters who kind of share certain characteristics, you got to check out The Captain is Dead. Great stuff. Absolutely adore this. Even if it is, maybe it goes a little bit on the long side, but otherwise it's just perfect. 
Riverboat. Um, Michael Kiesling had a big year in 2017. Brought out four games. Some he co-designed with others. This one was all him, and I think it was his best of the year. Haven't done a run through four yet, but I will be soon. But a very, very cle clever, puzzly games that actually takes ideas from several of the other games he put out that year and melds them together into what we found to be a very pleasant experience. So I'll be doing a run through for that once the voters choose to have me show it to you. Riverboat. Then we got London 2nd Edition. I've had London forever. It was in my top 10 engine builders of all time. And once I tried the 2nd Edition, the 1st Edition went right out the window. I do not miss the board, the map at all. This is so much smoother, streamlined, more pretty. It is just an improvement in every way for our taste. So, London 2nd Edition. Mwah! Oh, coming on down. We're almost done, folks. Motainai. Um, I don't really need this because, of course, I've got... Uh, Glory to Rome, and I'm not going to get rid of it, but this is a nice stand-in for Glory to Rome. I could sell Glory to Rome, though, and just keep this. Oh, I might have to rethink that now. I, Jen didn't hear me say that, though. So, anyway, but Mumtai Nai is a kind of nice Glory to Rome light kind of game with its own unique stuff, too. Uh, check out my run-through for more, as always. Anyway, Enchanters. This is a brand new game. This is kind of like a fantasy version of Morels. Um, and it kind of came out of nowhere at Essen 2017 and blew us away. Uh, loved it so much, we got the, the full thing, and it survived the big, massive cut. Really smart, smart game where players are enchanters making enchanted weapons to save a village. Um, Good stuff. Watch the run-through. Not as good as Jump Drive, though. Here's another top tenner for the year. This is the lightest, most streamlined version of Race for the Galaxy you can imagine, and that is like catnip to us. Oh my gosh, we have played this game dozens of times. We will sit down and play it anytime, anywhere. Just a quick, fun 15-minute filler that you just blow through in no time, maybe even 10 minutes sometimes, but an incredible sense of escalation. It tells an amazing story every time you play it. We love Jump Drive. Motion Pictures, the card game is very nice, too. And I'm sorry to say, uh, I'm sorry, folks, it's, that's going to be hard for you to find. It's all but disappeared, but it's a very neat, clever game um, full of cards that basically ape or mimic or satirize real-world movies and actors and directors and stuff like that. And you're basically just trying to run your own motion picture studio. Make the best movies, make the best TV shows and all that by putting the right talent together. Clever, fun card game. Great theme. Great presentation. Uh, shame it's going to be hard for anybody to find because it's a lot of fun. Motion picture's a card game. And then, oh, coming on down, almost done, we got Chimera Station from Tasty Minstrel Games. Brilliant worker placement stuff where you actually build your workers as you go and customize them um, while also building your worker placement board which is this big gigantic satellite that everybody so it's every time you play you're going to get such a radically different experience your workers are different the board is different the um the the objectives you chase after everything great stuff in chimera station and last but not least folks we are going to end with this war of mine another top 10 of the year Brilliant, wonderful, gorgeous, amazing achievement. Um, I loved it. I've played it a lot solo. I've played it a lot with Jen. I thought for sure she wouldn't enjoy it because of its harsh, harrowing subject matter. I mean, there's not a lot of joy to be had in this box. But you know, putting aside the fact that this is a simulation of real-life modern warfare from the point of view of a, pers of, a of a civilian, not a soldier, uh, is it, it's brilliant and it's it's moving. Jen really found it compelling, too, because it's a really a great survival story as well, as you just try to scavenge what you can and put together what you need to survive the winter and help people or, or not and just help yourself. It's amazing. It's, like I said, it's awe-inspiring. It was one of the be 10 best year, uh, this war of mine. And that's it, folks. There was our yearly update. Oh, hey, 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 before we sign out, I forgot one more thing. Here's a small handful of games that I've got but haven't decided if they get to make it onto the shelf or not. That happens every year when I film. There's still a few I'm trying to figure out. In this case, there is the Sanctuary, which is apparently a very, very cool, very unique worker placement game where when you put a worker down, you activate the space and everything to the left and the right of the space that your worker can see. So workers can block the view of other workers. It sounds really neat. I'm keen to try it. Hunt for the Ring, maybe this is going to be our hidden movement game where Jen gets to play as Gandalf trying to keep Frodo away from the Nazgul as no doubt I will be the Nazgul trying to hunt her down all over the place. And then there is Outpost Siberia. I'm really looking forward to this. It's just a simple little survival game with two-sided cards, which I'm always keen to check out. 
Then we've got Dark Souls, the card game. Now, I guess the board game had kind of mixed reviews. Not everybody was keen on it, but apparently I've heard good things, very, very good things about the card game, so I'm eager to try it out. I have to admit, I've never actually played the original video game, but I like the ideas therein. And we've got Castell from Renegade Games, who always put out high-quality stuff. And apparently, this is getting a lot of very, very positive buzz. It's a game about players trying to uh, compete in competitions to make human towers, which apparently are called Castells, I guess. Uh, looking forward to giving it a go. And then there's my story, something I picked up at Essen. I don't know much about it other than it is another one of those build the best life you can kind of games. I'm so keen on that theme. I'm always looking for a new take on it. And we've got Amon Ray the card game. Now, I've never played Amon Ray because it doesn't support two players. But I think I mentioned a little while ago, Reiner Knizia has been on a tear revisiting some of his older designs and making them work for new audiences. Maybe this will be another example of that. And we've got Space Base. This literally just showed up the other day. I know almost nothing about it, except for the fact that it is from the designer of Mystic Veil, vale, which Jen and I have enjoyed quite a bit. So I'm keen to give that one a go. And we've got Karuba, the card game. And uh, Karuba was fantastic. I can't wait to see how it's been changed up to be working in card form. And then you've got Freedom and Freeze Fortress, Flea and Fear. Three games that are part of the Fast Forward series, which is uh, they're card games that you learn how to play as you play. And I, would, I want to see how these experiments work. And then finally, a sweet little roll and write game, Harvest Dice. Haven't tried it yet, but it looks very, very charming. Might be a little too light, although it does have, quote, advanced rules. So we'll see how well that works out for us. Oh, hi, I forgot one more as well. Tybor the Builder, which is basically Alexander Schwister's sequel to Royal Goods, or Oh My Goods, as it's also known. Um, I'm pretty confident, as uh, so much we loved Royal Goods, and also Port Royal, that we're very much going to enjoy Tybor as well. Oh, sad, sad, sad. Um, but again, more than enough. Rich is a plenty. We could keep playing these games for the rest of our lives. So, world's smallest violin playing for me that I've gotten rid of 30% of it and might still get rid of some more. I don't know. But next year, folks, you're going to be seeing this update on a whole new wall, in a whole new city, on a whole new country, and a whole new continent. So who knows what it'll look like then. But otherwise, that's it. Thanks for watching. Have a very, very nice day. Talk to you later so long. Bye. Wish us luck on the move. Bye-bye.